president of the Indiana District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, um, whom I have known for probably 35 years, uh, a, a real gentle man, and I mean that in the, in the best sense of that term. Uh, he has written his doctoral dissertation on uh, Christ in the sacrifice of the Old Testament. And um, it's called Eating God's Sacrifice. I don't know if you read it but it is a profound book. Um, how many of you have had a chance to study Dr. John Kleinig's book, The, um, no, the, uh, the Commentary on Leviticus? Um, I don't know if it's in our library or not. I don't know what's in the library. The whole thing? No. Well, um, I happen to read the whole thing simply because I taught a course on Leviticus. Um, uh, and and I, I thought at that time that was the greatest explanation of Old Testament sacrifice I'd ever read was in Kleinig's commentary on Leviticus. But I do believe that Dr. Brady's book is, if not a little ahead, right next to that one. Um, and I think both of them are profound books. Um, what I want to draw your attention to today is it was from Dr. Brady um, that I learned that the Old Testament people oftentimes participated in the sacrifice by receiving from the priest a portion of the sacrifice, whether it was a grain offering or a meat offering. And so in my mind, when the angel, the seraphim, which means burning messenger, okay, takes that um, tongs, and takes a coal from the altar, in my mind, that could be referring to the sacrifice itself. And, uh, pardon me, but you should have an understanding of that sacrifice from the altar that comes to your lips um, and from the chalice. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, the older I get, the more I realize I am too late, too smart, and too soon, too old. And, um, you know, as I gather more and more of, of this, the, especially the Old Testament opens up in a profound way that Christ is seen everywhere. Uh, Dr. David Scare, who wrote a book on uh, All Theology is Christology, also had a comment about one of your favorite professors, deaconess, Dr. Just, who said, uh, Dr. Just could find the Lord's Supper in the yellow pages. <laughs> and, uh, um, I, I, I think, for example, the Emmaus disciples, uh, Dr. Just sees that 
as the giving of thanks, the breaking of the bread, and the distribution. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'm just saying it's profound. And I love that in-depth um, knowledge that these people share with us. Uh, to me, it's, it's just a great thing. Um, any comments or questions? On this. Okay, let's move on. Okay, uh, I before I leave that, um, I, yeah, sorry. Just to follow along with what you're saying, when we, because this is part of what I was teaching in Kenya with the deepnesses, is we, we are a part of that story from the beginning of creation. That's our story. And so when we read scripture Christologically, we see ourselves in that narrative and that everything points to Christ. So it, it, you know, it changes how we read the Old Testament. It changes how we see our part in all of that narrative. And someone described it as looking back and remembering in order to see the future, which is what Yeah, do. otherwise we don't, we don't fully get it. Yeah. And the Old Testament sacrifice was Christocentric in that sense. Absolutely. But um, as a child, you know, I can always remember that hymn from TLH, not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain mm -hmm. could c cleanse us from our guilt and shame through all eternity or something like that. Mary, quick question. Testament sacrifices are Christocentric. Yes, yeah. That they they so always they, pointed they pointed us to the sacrifice. They Just as hundreds and yeah. thousands of right. animals right. on an altar, and that's Christocentric. Yeah, absolutely, <clears throat> because that points us to how forgiveness was given through the shedding of blood, but the ultimate forgiveness comes through. <clears throat> The shedding of Christ's blood. You know that 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 had to be repeated daily, weekly. <laughs> Thank you. I married above my station in life. Oh, it's the very first stanza. I, was, I thought it was stanza four. Um, this is this hymn. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altar slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. It was a temporary, always a temporary. And the New Testament is permanent, always permanent. And the Old Testament always points us toward that. Just like John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But do we look back now and see if that's Christocentric, or were they literally told that? Um, I think the answer to your question is yes. It wasn't an either-or, Rick. It's a both-end. Um, the people at that time were promised in the garden, for example, that God would send a deliverer. And if, if that's in Genesis 3, right? And if you read Genesis 4, um, Eve gives birth and says, I have, lo, I have begotten a son, the Lord. A man, a man, the Lord. Boy, was she wrong. It was Cain. But she understood the promise. See, God would send a deliverer. And that deliverer would ultimately be the one who would deliver us from all sin. And so everything else is preparatory for that on the way. And that's the sadness in my mind that um, the Jewish people are still looking for the Messiah. Many of them. I shouldn't say Jewish. Uh, the, the Hebrew worshipers are still in the Old Testament. As, by the way, uh, are Seventh-day Adventists. If we can keep the Sabbath perfect one time, then God will come. They, they would say the second time, because they talk about Jesus, but not as that deliverer. That's the sadness. Thank you, Mrs. Froh. Um, 
Before I leave this topic, I want to draw your attention to the handout from the, the Lutheran Clarion. Um, it was written by a friend of mine who uh, shared a lot with me, including COVID, um, when we were there at uh, Fort Wayne. He was diagnosed on Wednesday, and we were diagnosed on Thursday. It's the way life is. Um, <clears throat> but, but anyway, um, he wrote this article about this uh, Finnish bishop. Now, you understand that Finland is considered a part of, of the European community, a Western country, all right? And yet, when you read this article, you find out that the bishop and one of the members of parliament, who's a medical doctor, who happens to be what you and I would call a real Lutheran, um, uh, speaks out against uh, gender transformation and all kinds of things like that. And that is now classified in European Union and elsewhere as a hate speech. So uh, I just want to draw your attention to that to wake up because believe me folks, it's coming here. It's coming. And I think you can read this. Please do it on your own time. Don't take Bible class. Okay. You can do it during the sermon. Yeah, do it during the sermon. <laughs> Pray with me, please. Pray for you? Back to it. Pray with me and for me. O oh Lord, keep your family, the church, continually in the true faith, that relying on the hope of your we may ever be defended by the mighty power through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless and preserve you. Amen. Okay, um, Vicki of, uh, well, um, Vicki passed out these sheets, so you have them. Today we want to talk about vocation according to uh, the Apostles' Creed. And we must begin in the middle. Um, because without the message of Christ, we have no faith in God. We have no true trust in God. And then we must move to the third article to see how that faith comes. And that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Or as we Lutherans are, say, are prone to say, through word and sacrament, the gift of Christ is distributed. But we must always remember that that word is not unaccompanied. The Holy Spirit is always connected to the word. My first time with Dr. Quill teaching in Africa was in Ethiopia. And it was very interesting because um, I had never taught before. Um, in a foreign country. Uh, I'd never been to Africa before. And I'd never worked with a translator. And I noticed that there was a disconnect between what I was saying and what the translator was saying because there was um, one deaconess in the group who was a bishop's daughter and knew English better than I think my translator did. And he would start to translate and she'd frown. And um, whenever that happened, I knew he was saying something I hadn't said. So uh, after a while, I'd never done this before, I said, uh, 
please just tell them what I said. I will endeavor to correct it uh, if I make a mistake as we go along. But the issue was, where do you find the Holy Spirit? And for uh, the, our Lutheran uh, uh, fellow Christians in Ethiopia, which is the largest and fastest growing church in the world, it has over 13 million members. And uh, when I say fastest growing, that's, they're not the largest. Rome is still that. But other than that, they are, they're chasing Rome exponentially. <laughs> and um, they are very mission-minded. But they oftentimes operate without the word following the inner spirit. Okay, now that becomes problematic if it's not connected to the Word. And as I'm going through this, I struggled and struggled how to do that. My teacher wife sent me with wall charts, uh, 3M empty sheets of paper, and um, I wrote all over those things. And finally, I took a clean one, stuck it on the wall, and wrote on that, um, uh, the Holy Spirit. And then over the top of that, I wrote WORD in capital letters. If you're looking for the Holy Spirit, you will only find the Holy Spirit in the Word. word. And you will always find the Holy Spirit in the Word. And we will talk about that today as we confess our faith also in the third article. I think I've done something bad here. I have lost. Whoop. Sorry. Well, that's true. Okay. Now back to the back to the other picture. That was taken in Australia, by the way. All right. Here we go. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Those, you will remember from your confirmation class, wink, wink, nod, nod, is the state of humiliation of Christ where he humbles himself, according to Philippians 2, becomes obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Um, and that ends with his burial. His state of exaltation begins with his descent into hell. And I don't remember who it was, but I just had this, well, Walter, was you, yeah, had this discussion on Thursday um, in our uh, adult Bible class, uh, or our men's Bible class. Um, Women are adults, too. I should know that. Um, Christ descended into hell not to suffer, but to proclaim his victory over Satan. And this you can find in Colossians 2, um, that the Father triumphed over Satan in Christ, proclaiming his victory over him. And that was what we call the descent of Christ into hell. So he descends into hell. The third day he rises again from the dead. And from, from our standpoint, this descent into hell and the resurrection probably is in the blink of an eye on that third day. We, we, we don't understand God's uh, timekeeping because we keep time in a different way. Um, he uh, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, which again is not a place but a position. All authority in heaven and on earth has been entrusted to me. Therefore, you be going and be making disciples. So it's a position of authority where he rules and reigns over all things. The Father Almighty, from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. That's our final hope. And we await it um, sometimes with more expectation than at other times. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my 
bullet. <laughs> Vocationally speaking, the key word here is Lord. He's the one who calls the shots in your life and mine. We don't, even though we sometimes think we do. <laughs> who has redeemed me? What does redeem mean? To buy back. Okay? So if you want to think of it this way, Christ's purpose is to redeem the world. What does that mean? <laughs> Satan usurps the authority of God in the fall. And God, through his prophets of the Old Testament, pointing to Jesus, keeps telling us again and again that he will bring us back into his kingdom. And he does that by the redemption. And redemption always was done, um, it, it's covenant language, to redeem, and it always involves the shedding of blood. In the old covenant, that shedding of blood was done with animals. Not only in the sacrifices, but in all covenants. Lot and Jacob cut a covenant. And what does that involve? It involves the shedding of the blood of an animal, and then the announcement as the animal was stripped, and then the blood poured out, so be it unto me if I annul or break this covenant. And then that became part of the whole sacrificial system under Moses um, in the Old Testament, and so on and so forth. Um, and he has purchased an one man from all sins, death, and the power of the devil. Doesn't that sound baptismal? Okay. Um, and how has he done this? Not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. And why has he done this again? That I may be his own. Covenant language, vocational language. And live under him in his kingdom. Covenant language, vocational language. And serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Covenant language, vocational language. Just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. And when I used to teach this to... Uh, my junior confirmants, I would go. This is most certainly true. When they got to that part, they loved that. They got to bang the table. This is most certainly true. This is your confession, by the way. This is what you confess every time you speak the creed. You are confessing that Christ is your Lord, your Savior, who has redeemed you, bought you back with his innocence, his suffering, his death. And to put your emphatic emphasis on that, this is most certainly true. Okay? And this is why the people of God should not need to be beaten with sticks over the head to tell them who they are. We're His. Everything we have comes from Him. Everything we are is gift, not earned. Okay? Pastor? Yes. yes. So, <clears throat> this is where I get really muddled, is in the idea of service and serving. Um, that sounds like something that I have to do and need to do and must do. But how do I do that? Can we change need, have to, and must? Can we change those verbs? Yeah. Let's just put this out there. Will. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And you're absolutely right. This is why I get so hyper when people mistranslate Matthew 28, 18 to 20. They leave out 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
and they start with therefore. And they make therefore not a connection to the work of Christ, <coughs> but a law. Therefore, you must be going. You must be. And, you know, as a young pastor, I think I was guilty of using some of that language. I really do. It's a good I, way to motivate people. Yeah, you can motivate people that way. Guilt, guilt, what do we call it? Lutheran guilt? Catholic guilt? You know, we've got all kinds of guilts out there. And, and that's absolutely true. Um, we, we are motivated more by guilt than by gift. And I am arguing today as a more mature uh, called minister of Christ that perhaps we should speak gospel language when we're talking gospel gifts. And, um, you, you know, Dennis, sometime when we have some private time, I'll, I'll tell you this story about when I was at a synod meeting and the people from the Purple Palace, as it's called, um, were, What's that? were, were advocating, advocating a <laughs> fundraiser. And it was very interesting to me because there wasn't a parish pastor on that committee, which was appointed by Dr. Barry, by the way, that committee. And it was, there was laymen and pastors. <coughs> um, but there wasn't a parish pastor there who didn't have an understanding of what stewardship really is. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was fascinating that somehow they figured that out. And um, the people <coughs> in charge wanted to have this and, and believe me, the, the parish pastors as well as the laymen fought against that. There is a big difference between fundraising and stewardship. Stewardship is like your baptism. It's lifelong. It's not an act. It's a, it's a way of life. And fundraising, okay, I'm not going to dispute whether we should or shouldn't fundraise. Sometimes people need a little law to understand that that's not theirs. It belongs to God. And they shouldn't be selfish with it. He has blessed them with it. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But... In my lifetime, we have had at least five fundraisers to end all fundraisers in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. This will be the last fundraiser. I'll bet you you can remember some. Forward in Remembrance, um, Alive in Christ, Alive in Christ Again, or whatever it was. Um, uh, and then when I was young, we were all supposed to give, um, I was glad I was younger then, uh, a dollar for every... Uh, a year of our our life so I was 18 at the time so I had to cough up $18 from from my lawn mowing um, monies you know I, I, I forget what that one was called maybe some of you can remember That's that was a long back. time ago that was a long time ago <laughs> you, you notice I mostly remember a long times ago Barb <laughs> that, that's a sign of something I'm not sure what it is but it is a sign of something. So, uh, this is the work of God. The work of Christ. And that is what he does. He calls me. Then when we say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, we also say the Holy Catholic Church. Um, Catholic was not in the uh, Apostles' Creed, but was always in the Nicene and Athanasian Creed. Um, I'm not going to dispute that. Catholic simply means universal, not Roman. Okay, the communion of saints, and I think there's a distinct difference here because that communion of saints, we could talk about we part our joint participants in holy things. And by the way, the difference between saint and holy thing is one letter in the Greek alphabet, hagion versus hagia. And there are many scholars today who believe that initially the creed was, I believe in the communion of holy things, which we would call word and sacrament. Now, I'm not going to get into a big debate over that issue, because both are true. Holy people, holy things. And holy things for holy people. That is why, in my mind, the holy Catholic Church, that is, the one universal church throughout the world, 
precedes the holy things because it is a possession of the holy people. And the holy people are holy, not internally by themselves, but because they are participants in the holy things. Um, the forgiveness of sins, and by the way, forgiveness of sins, we really don't get to see that, do we? We experience it at times. There are times when the forgiveness of sins brings tears to our eyes, or maybe a hug or something like that, but we really have to take that by the spoken word, don't we? I forgive you. How can any man do that? Well, it's not just any man. It's God's appointed man who speaks for him. That's how. And it's God who does the forgiving, not the man. The man is of the mouthpiece. That's it. It is God's work of forgiveness. But he is the mouthpiece. And by the way, that, that applies to the public administration of forgiveness of sins. In your baptism, you have been ordained to forgive sins within your vocation. That's my thesis, and I dare you to dispute it biblically. <laughs> okay? I'd be open to that discussion. The, the resurrection of the body. Any of you seen that yet? <laughs> Therefore, it is by faith. Now, biblically speaking, we call that hope. We hope for what we have not seen, yet believe it as reality, even though it's not yet fully present. And life everlasting. Now, let's look at the third article of the Creed. Yes, Mary? So, we're like the Jewish people. They're hoping for a Messiah, and we're hoping to see the resurrection. Well, yeah, hope, that's the biblical term that's used all the time. For, for we do not hope for, for what we see, but we hope for what we do not yet see. And that's how that term is used. And if, if you want to say it this way, let it, let's say it a different way. Let's say as the Old Testament people looked backward in faith to the promises of God given, say, in the garden to Adam and Eve, given through Abraham, given through David, given through Isaiah, and it becomes a broader and broader perspective of what the Messiah will be. Okay, They look back into these promises of God with faith and with hope to the first coming of the Messiah. Okay, The coming in the flesh of the Messiah. The first visible coming. We, on this side of the resurrection, look back to that fulfillment in Christ, in faith, and forward in hope to what we have not yet fully received, but is ours already. <coughs> and, and that language, already, not yet. Does that ring a bell, Deaconess? That's Arthur just all over the place. Okay, already, not yet. And, and that's Advent language. <clears throat> it's, in a sense... Um, uh, Lent language, uh, the fulfillment is there, not yet fully. And, and it's really Christian hope. That, that's why we use that term. So, <clears throat> from my perspective, this is some of the most <coughs> profound <coughs> biblical theology that is not um, taken directly from the Bible. I mean, it is drawn from what is taught in the Bible, uh, but it is it is not stated in this way. I believe that I cannot believe. <laughs> That's pretty profound when you think about it. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to Him. That is where all of us must begin. That is where Isaiah began in today's Old Testament lesson, as you will hear. I am a man of unclean lips. I cannot stand in the presence of God. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. The Holy Spirit has enlightened me with his gifts. And here his gifts are a knowledge of God as creator, redeemer, and giver 
of gifts. And the Holy Spirit sanctifies me and keeps me in the true faith. What does sanctify mean? That would be consecrated. What is sanctified? To be kept holy. To make, to made holy. How does the Holy Spirit make you holy? When I look at you sometimes, I don't see all that holiness. <laughs> and I think you probably could say the very same thing. How does the Holy Spirit make us holy? Now think about the liturgy here, folks. Here it comes. If we were to do this in a, a proper liturgical manner, we would stand outside of the entrance in the parish hall and go through the service of confession and absolution. And then we would come into the church. Why? Because when God proclaims us forgiven, that means we are forgiven. And what keeps us from holiness? Sin. What has been forgiven? Sin. And so, here is where I, I love the, the liturgy in this sense. It, it began, the liturgy we use today really begin, began with the intro. The confession and absolution took place before our entrance. And then the intro was the entrance into the presence of God. Now we come having been, uh, yeah, coal on the tongue, huh? having been cleansed from sin, we come with a mouth that speaks praise and a soul that is holy. Not in and of itself, but because of the word of Christ. So that's what the Holy Spirit does. Calls us by the gospel, enlightens us with his gifts, sanctifies and keeps us in the true faith. In this same manner, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in this one true faith. In this church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins. That doesn't mean we have to be gathered to have sins forgiven. It means we have to be living in, with faith in Christ, in our baptism. And that's how sins are forgiven to me and all believers. And on the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most... Oh, Renee, certainly true. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Renee. Somebody has learned a good lesson today. Now, Fro is going to argue that from the second article and the third article, we now can rightly understand the first article. Without the second article, without the third article, how we come to faith, how we have salvation, how we come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit, third article, we cannot properly understand God as creator. Does anyone want to dispute that? Okay, then we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. But we can say this. I believe that God has made me and all creatures. We need to be stewards of our environment, stewards of creation, because that's what Adam and Eve were called to do. Adam was to tend God's creation. So are we. Um, now, I'm not going to get into debate about global warming or not global warming or global ice age or not or sunspots or any of that. Uh, that's a scientific question that can be answered and pondered. What I am going to say is simply that God is behind creation. And I believe, as did some of our early um, Christian scientists <coughs> believe, that true science is thinking God's thoughts after him. And there's a wonderful video put out 
I don't remember the name of it right now, uh, The Amazing Planet or something like that, um, that where, where the point is that in the, in the Milky Way, the only place where one can observe the rest of the galaxy is guess where? On Earth, right where we live. It's the only place. And so we are sending uh, telescopes up into space to come back. So we are beginning to think God's thoughts after him. We're beginning to see um, the, the relationship that we have as creatures. What we also confess is God has given me my body and soul, my eyes, ears, and my throat that always retains a virus much longer than the rest of my body, and it's a thorn in the flesh, and I am tired of it. Lord, take it away from me. Like Paul, I appealed at least three times yesterday and the day before, and the day before that. And what does God say? My grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in your failures, your weakness, your misunderstanding. So God has given me all these things, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. Yeah. God has not abandoned his creation. Uh, most of you are old enough to remember the 60s, the God is dead movement. Hmm? Uh, Altizer, Altizer, I guess his name was, and a few other atheists, uh, God is dead. Uh, well, okay. Uh, for you, perhaps, mm -hmm. uh, but not for the rest of us. In a practical way, that means that God gives clothing and shoes, food and drink. And we've talked about this in previous sessions, where God doesn't simply deliver a pair of shoes uh, to your doorstep when you need them. He uses Amazon to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, Amazon may not even be aware that that's what they're doing, but they are participating in God's care for you when they do that. Well, I hope he asks me someday. I'd be delighted to share that insight with you. Um, so, the, the same thing at, at the restaurant. You know, your waiter, the per person, people, people, not person, the people in the kitchen, etc., etc. This is how God feeds you. The same way at the supermarket. And we can go on and on. God richly and daily provides me with all that I need. Why do you suppose I highlighted that word? It's not want. Thank you. <laughs> Most of us confuse wants and needs. Okay? We want a Maserati. We need a bus that goes near our door. Okay, you get my point? We confuse needs and wants. Our old nature does that. And we, we use language like, we deserve. You know, I, over the years, this pastor has been assaulted on a numerous occasions with the question, um, why do I deserve this, pastor? What have I done wrong? It took me about 20, 25 years of pastoral care to come up with a definitive answer to that. And the definitive answer is to answer the way Jesus does, by asking a question. If God gave you what you deserved, what would you have? <laughs> it took me a long time to come up with that, with that answer. I'm serious. Because I was trying to defend God's honor. God can take care of that himself. You know, he doesn't need me to do that. All that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger, guards and protects me from all evil. Notice the language there. Who's running the verbs? God. That makes the first article gospel, doesn't it? God's running the verbs. God's doing the doing. Okay, we're not. God is busy doing it. 
loves and defends, guards, and protects me. And why does he do this? Because I deserve it. In spite of what I deserve, he does it. All this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in moi. Nothing here. For all this, it is my duty to thank, praise, serve, and obey. This is most certainly true. Thank you. Wow. I, when, when, when the new pastor comes. <laughs> the first time he does this. Let's all do it. I hope I'm here. Okay. This is most certainly true. Yeah, sorry. Seth, I just wanted to point out that it's, in that statement there is duty. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the idea of duty is very different than a job. Um, kind of going back to Dennis's, you know, um, <clears throat> how, how is this on me? <coughs> duty is, is more of a response to, to something right, where a job is something that you have to, to work at. A job you must click in. Right. You, you check in. You know, the, the, I'm, I'm on board now. I, I put my pay stuff in. Whatever. Okay. That, that, that's a, an obligation to do. Duty is what I must do because of what someone else has done for me or to me. Um, a duty is what I owe my country if I am serving in the military. It's a response. And it's a response. And I think that's probably a better term. For all this, my response, and that's gospel language, is to thank and praise, serve, and obey. This is most certainly true. Um, yeah, if I were to translate Matthew 28, 18 into palatable English from the gist of the Greek, Fro would translate it something like this. Jesus speaks. All authority in heaven and on earth has been entrusted to me. Therefore, you be going with that authority into all the world, making disciples of all people by baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, of the Holy Spirit, or in the name, and by teaching them to reverence all that I have entrusted to you. Remember, these are the eleven. All that I have entrusted to you. <coughs> These were the, the seminary, first graduating class. Okay? And um, they, they knew how pitifully unprepared they were. And I will send the Holy Spirit, therefore stay in Jerusalem till I do that. And he will... And that John 14, John 15, John 16, those three chapters all have um, a, a, a section in them that talks about, I will send the Holy Spirit. When the Comforter comes, he will bring to your mind all the things that I have taught you and you have forgotten. Okay. He doesn't say that. That's an addendum by Fro. But um, the point here again is that this authority of Christ is what runs your life. It runs your life whether you are an apostle or whether you are a recipient of mercy and grace in baptism. It is what runs your life. And you may say, just as Paul did, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I believe that's what um, Galatians 2, 20, something like that. Okay, anything else? So, what, what is all this about? Within your vocation as husband, wife, child, parent, employer, employee, and sometimes you are both a, or all or a combination of those things all at the same time, you are first and foremost God's own child. God's own child. And therefore, 
This is how you live and walk and learn. Now, it is true that sometimes pastors have to remind God's people, you're a sinner. And part of that being a sinner means you are using what God has entrusted to you in somewhat of a selfish manner. But for me to say, therefore, if you want to get out of that, this is what you do. No, 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 no. That's not my, my vocation. That's yours. That's your vocation. You know when you have extraordinary expenses because you've got three kids in college mm -hmm. at the same time. You know, you know that you've got health issues that you need to deal with now. You know those. I don't know those things. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Doesn't matter. That's your vocation, not mine. And you have to sort that out. But you do so knowing whose you are and what he has done for you. <coughs> and what he has entrusted to you. Not only the means of grace, but the means of proclaiming that grace. Um, Deaconess just came back from Kenya, um, uh, and, and she went there on the mercy of people's mites, her contributions, and, and brought mercy to those people. Um, when Mrs. Fro and I taught in Kenya, you know, we went on the, uh, on the basis of, well, the last, three or four years, we went on, on the synod's time, as I call it. The first two we went on our own, um, because I felt an obligation, and they had asked me to come. Synod said, go, fine, just don't ask us for money. <laughs> so I didn't for two years, and then when they wanted me back, then the synod changed their mind, and they, and they gave us money for transportation. And then uh, people like, like Walt, um, got to send books over the last time we went because they forgot to tell me I was teaching this class before I went. Oh. <laughs> and those were the most expensive art just books I've ever had in my entire life. They were already worth $500 when they got to Walt, but the time they got to me there was another what, uh, almost, I think it was 1400 the total bill. And then good old Kenya government wanted to charge me tax on that too, mm -hmm. even though it was educational. Yeah. It is the way life be. Sometimes you live and you cry and so on. Any questions you might have on vocation? Yes. Yeah. Not necessarily on vocation, okay. and loosely speaking, how many um, other denominations hold to this creed as we read? Loosely, I'm not looking for The Apostles' them. Creed? Uh -huh. I would say every Christian denomination um, confesses the Apostles' Creed, whether they confess it or not. Okay. There are some denominations that say, give us deeds, not creeds. But yet they do not deny what the Apostle, uh, the <coughs> Apostles' Creed teaches. But by and large, a Christian church holds to this creed. Historically, Christian churches are defined <coughs> uh, as those who do not deny what is taught in the Apostles, the Nicene, Constantinopolitan, and the Athanasian Creed. So anyone who denies that, okay. such as um, Jehovah Witnesses, mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventists, um, mm -hmm. Mormons, would fall outside of that. Although Mormons, you know, are one of the few denominations, so-called denominations, that have the word Jesus Christ in their titles. I think it's kind of interesting. But he's not Christ in the sense that you and I would understand Christ. Not as Lord. Thank you. <clears throat> any, any, anyone else? Anything else? Anything further? I, I would just like to say Dr. Quill did a wonderful job with this, but his ending, when we give witness in the vocation into which he have been, in, to which we have been called, it may seem insignificant, but just wait and be prepared to buckle up. A few words, a little pamphlet with the doctor, and one little word can tell them. Yeah, so 
Um, that, that, that was good. Well, Dr. Quill is my hero, like Dr. Justice and Deaconess is hero. <laughs> uh, I, I just, I just want to say I have utmost respect for his um, churchmanship and his, um, uh, his ability to write in very clear and concise language. Um, it, it's, it's a good thought. And, and I love the fact that he put vocation in there. And so I came across it and I said, wow, I have to get that to my class uh, before we adjourn this class. So next week, Deaconess is on board with her Kenyan journey. Um, she will be sharing with you. Um, and uh, thank you for the time you have allotted me and your patience in our discussions. Um, I get kind of long-winded about these things sometimes because I think you shall be converted for my much speaking. <laughs> I actually know better than that, but the temptation is always there. So we adjourn with the apostolic benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.